So I'm called to be an overcomer. I'm called to be an overcomer. In order for us to win, we got to strive for everything that God has for our lives. I'm here to strive. I'm here to strive. Open your Bible to John's Gospel, chapter 10. I'm going to give you some scripture tonight. I want to put a demand on us as believers that we need to put a demand on ourselves and put the demand on God. How far am I willing to go with God? There you go. How far am I willing? How hungry am I? How desperate do I want to be in Christ? Do I want my salvation to just be I just got saved? Or I want it to mean something in the courts of heaven. Do I want to fulfill the purpose and the calling and the election of God in my life? Do I want to see the kingdom of God minister to me and through me? Do I want to be a vessel useful to the master? Do I want to just get by or do I want to be somebody who moves through all the things of life? And when I get to the other side, I hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. But on this side, we need the fire. On this side, we need the power. On this side, we need the anointing. On this side, we need His glory to reign on us so we as the body of Christ can really transform a nation and a generation. See, I'm a transformer. Come on, you're a lightning bug. You're a transformer. John's, I got you, didn't I? John's Gospel, chapter 10. Look at how they're looking. I want you to start looking at the anointing and the ministry of Jesus and what He came for. So you and I can walk in this and say, how far do I want to go? How deep am I in the things of God? How much do I want the Word of God to mean something? How far do I want to go? Breakthrough, healing, the anointing. I want breakthrough. I want healing. I need the anointing, but all for a reason. Somebody say reason. Reason. It's because when I walk out those doors, you walk out those doors tonight, you can be a greater effective believer than you were when you walked in these doors. You are called to be a life changer, a nation changer. You'll be a transformer in the things of heaven. There's a light of heaven supposed to walk on you because you are a revelation of the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, verse 10, chapter 10 of John's gospel. He said, here's the problem. He says, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. That's why there's sickness. That's why there's disease. That's why there's brokenness. That's why there's oppression. That's why there's depression. That's why there's fear. That's why there's darkness. That's why there's suicide. That's why there's anxiety. That's why there's trials and struggles and problems and wars and hatred. Because the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But we as believers, we've grasped the hold of the second half of that verse. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus said, but I have come. Do you understand? That's That's a radical warrior mindset. But I have come. Jesus dropped himself right down the middle of devils, demons, and darkness. And he went to war against all of it. Think about it. He went to war against every disease, against every sickness, against every devil. He didn't leave one left untouched in his ministry. He healed all that were oppressed. Set everyone free that touched him. Come on, he came for a fight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And what's exciting is he started it, but you and I get to help be a part of the finishing of it. He said, but I have come that you might have life, and you might have that life abundantly. Say abundant. Abundant. That's the creative miracle power of God. God wants an abundant anointing in your life. He wants the abundance of his grace in your life, the abundance of his victory in his life, the abundance of his purpose in your life. Go to Isaiah chapter 55. So we need to grasp some things as believers tonight. Before we get into a couple of scriptures that I want, I wanted to get these two scriptures settled into your spirit that Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. That means he's come to overthrow the powers of darkness that try to wage war against your life. That's what he's come for. He's come for a fight. Are you ready for a fight? Are you ready for a fight? Come on. Are you ready for a fight? Hallelujah. Victory is ours when the battle is the Lord. That means you're a warrior. You put on the whole armor of God, right? That you may, you may stand your ground in the evil day, and after having done all things, you're found standing, and the devil is found defeated, and there's assault against your life. Because you're a warrior. That's what you're called to be. Isaiah 55, verse 10. And it says that as the rain comes down from heaven, and the snow from heaven, and do, does not return there, but waters the earth, And makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. There's a purpose in it, right? 
There's a purpose in the rain and the snow, and that is seed being sown, seed being set, seed grown, seed producing, and you, and, and you receiving of the seed. He says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Think about it. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. He said, I've come that you may have life and life abundantly. He has released a word for your victory. I can do all things through Christ. That's the word that's released. He'll do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ever ask or think. His redemptive power can save me to the uttermost. His word has been sent. He says, so shall be the word that has gone forth from my mouth. It shall accomplish what I have pleased. Somebody go, "Mm mm-hmm. You know, so often as believers, we get ourselves into this kind of a funky, fear-minded attitude that we don't want to. We don't want to get the devil all stirred up. But the problem is, he's terrified of the word of God, and he's terrified of a believer that has the word of God, and he's totally terrified of a believer that has the word of God that believes the word of God, and it goes to the next level. A believer that has the word of God believes the word of God and uses the word of God. Yeah. My wife's just looking at me. See. <laughs> A believer that has the Word of God, believes the Word of God, and uses the Word of God is a threat to hell. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. You're the church, and he's still building. He's still growing. He's still increasing. You are a part of it. Hallelujah. You are a life changer. You are a transformer in God. So shall my word be. That comes forth from my mouth. It shall not return forth. So there's some things that we need. Somebody say, what do I need? I don't know. Go to Isaiah chapter 6. I need. There's three things I need to make a decision out of my life. One, I need a genuine God revelation of himself and of his glory. I need to know Jesus according to the word. Not just according to an opinion. Definitely not according to the news media. I need to know Jesus. I need to see him according to the word of God. He's not some money milk toast hanging on a cross. He's not just a nice guy you can sit down with Pepsi and pizza with. It's not what Jesus would do or what car he would drive. It's what he's done. It's already completed. He's seated far above. He's a king on his throne, and we as the believers need to see him as such. That's your strength. You are citizens of his kingdom. And we need to get the God revelation because that's the anointing of authority and faith and power that will cause you to become what God's designed you to be. When you know the one you're serving is seated in splendor and all of heaven is on your side, then you will step forward knowing he's got it. He's got it. Somebody say he's got it. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. No, you won't sing that song. Isaiah chapter 6. You got to have fun in church. Somebody say fun in church. You got to have, come on, pastor, you got to have, listen, you got to have fun in church, okay? Listen, I'm going to do something that, 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 that's going to shock some of you. Ready? Don't do that. I'm going to stand on a chair. I'm going to stand on two chairs. I'm just doing it to say, look. How excited about you are you about your faith? How excited are you about how many? Excited about your faith. And the goal is that anybody who's not, we want to change that. To make you excited. Number one, I need a vision and a revelation of the holiness of God. Isaiah chapter 6. It says, In the king that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Isaiah's entire ministry was connected to a revelation and a vision of the king in all of his splendor, and that changed everything about him. Spirit of God comes on your life, into your life, gives you a revelation of Jesus Christ as victor, as overcomer, as one who paid the price, raised from the dead, seated in power, coming again in glory. All authority in heaven and earth belongs to him. That's the king we serve. How big is your Jesus? In order for us to win and have victory, we got to have a revelation of the king in all his splendor. Notice in Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and exalted. And all the train of his robe, all the glory of his robe filled the temple. This is the Shekinah glory of God filling the entire house. 
radiant. This was a man who was a, who was a priest and thought he did everything right until he saw the glory of God. Then he saw himself in light of heaven. See, if we're going to bring a nation to God, a generation to the power of the cross, we got to recognize absolute holiness. We got to preach absolute holiness. We got to declare absolute holiness. And we've got to do it without an apology. I don't apologize for the glory of my king. I don't apologize for the righteousness that flows from him. I don't apologize for the Shekinah glory that just wraps itself around him and the reign of heaven that moves with him. I don't apologize for the power of the blood that he shed on that cross. I don't apologize that sins have been forgiven. I don't apologize for that, but I celebrate in that. That's my victory. Because I need the revelation of where I stand without him. Or I'm ineffective for him. I need that revelation. Church loses sight of the king. She no longer has become effective. Becomes like the salt thrown out to the side which has lost its flavor and lost its ability. And he says, I saw him seated far above. And I saw him high in the throne. And I saw the seraphim gathered about him. And they were circling the throne crying out, holy, 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 holy. Realize that John the Revelator saw the same thing, the book of Revelation. They were still there from Isaiah's time to when John the Revelator got whisked into the third heaven and saw the glory of God. He saw what Isaiah saw. Wow. See, you and I get it right here. And we get it by the Spirit of God in here. And then the anointing of heaven explodes this way. And you go, I got it. I got a revelation to God. I got it. No, we're not going to sing that song. That's twice we're not going to sing that song. And notice he says, they cry out, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door of the temple were shaken by the voices of them that cried out. And the house was filled with the glory of God. Are you kidding me? To have the anointing of God sweep into the house. I tell the story, I was in Puerto Rico with Dr. Leon Van Royen in his service. And there were about eight, nine hundred people, stone floor, so none of these courtesy drop things going on. Stone floor, big old warehouse. The place was packed. And the power of God fell in that house. I saw him moving through in splendor and the reign of glory wrapped around him. And then his glory came through. People began to shout, the whole place. The glory of God filled the house. People were blown to the ground. Preachers were blown to the ground. The anointing of God moved in that place. One glimpse of his glory and we recognize how frail we are in his mighty presence. And all they could do was shout holy and glorify him and worship him and praise him. See, the vision that we need as believers is the king seated in all of his splendor. So like Isaiah, we cry out, Lord, redeem me. That's what he said. I'm a man of unclean lips amongst an unclean people. All I can speak is what my heart is. And my heart is evil, so my words are not good. That's why the angel of God ran and took a coal from the fire of the altar. A declaration of the sacrifice that had been given. Brought it and touched his tongue. And said, I touch your tongue. Your whole being is sanctified. I sanctify you with the fire from the altar of heaven. And once I touch your tongue, I cleanse the inside of you. And now you are a vessel useful to the master. Say, I want to be useful. I want to be useful. One touch of God's got to change your language. You understand? The touch of God should change your language. Talk about the outpouring power of the Holy Spirit. People talk about praying in tongues. I believe it. Hallelujah. Pray in the Holy Ghost. But the Bible says a young generation is going to prophesy, see visions, and dream dreams. They're going to prophesy the things of God. They're going to dream the things of God. Then they're going to see what God has in vision and revelation, and they're going to chase it. You are changed as a child of God. So they got to have the vision. Isaiah caught the vision. God said, who's going to go for me? And now we have the vision on the inside. And he says, here I am. Somebody say, send me. me. Good. Where would you like to go? I'm just (laughs) starting. See, we can't be afraid of what's outside that wall. We can't be. You are a revelation of God to somebody. 
you are a revelation of kingdom power to somebody. When we get this, we have to make a decision. Now, I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. If you get the first Kings, turn right. If you get the Chronicles, you went too far, turn left. I got to get the vision. I got to get the heart of God. I got to want the heart of God. It's a scary thing. Because the revelation of God shows me myself in the presence of God. That's what's so exciting about Calvary. See, I get to see myself in the light of the power of grace. And then I get to see myself in the light of the cross. And I get to see my sins forgiven as I lay down that old man transformed and renewed and put on the new man which is created after Christ Jesus. I become a new creation in Christ because why I've let the old man be crucified. Because I got a revelation of the king and his holiness and I got a revelation of the prize of a cross and one who hung there bleeding, beaten beyond recognition, skin ripped from his body and his, and his beard ripped from his face, hung there and forgave me and I received forgiveness and deliverance there. Hallelujah. Then I can face the vision because the vision brought me my redemption. And that was makes you a genuine believer because you understand the need to be forgiven. You understand the need to be washed from sin. You understand the need to be cleansed from unrighteousness. You understand the need because one glimpse from God and you know exactly what you need. You need a Savior. We can't win a nation if we don't preach the power of the cross. We can't win a generation. If we don't preach resurrection power, we can't win a nation. If we're not allowed to talk about sin, we can't win a nation. If we're offended by the holiness of God, we can't win a nation. They're still going to hell. They can feel your church. They can feel everything you got. You can pack up all the pews, but they're still going to hell because you never preach redemption, salvation, and deliverance. They do not know that they need a Savior because you're offended to use the word sin because somebody might, might get offended. Well, offend the hell right out of them. Come on! Got to love people enough to tell them the truth. But you can't unless you got the revelation. Because you can say that with a smile on your face. Because you got the glory cloud of God on you. People ought to be convicted in your presence. They ought to apologize for swearing in your presence. Because there's just something about you that just convicts them. In a world where every snowflake wants a safe zone. Everybody wants their own little hiding place. And nobody wants to be convicted. And you can't talk about sin to your kids. Well, your kids are going to hell if you don't tell your kids about Christ. If you're not walking and living for Christ, then you're a hypocrite. Time to tell your kids not to live. they got to live for Christ. And get your life right with Christ first. And then tell your kids they got to live right for Christ. Let me say amen to that. I hear these people all the time trying to tell us, well, you can't talk about it because you did something when you were a kid. You know, I sure can talk about it because I could have died when I was a kid. And I want to make sure the next generation doesn't do that. Come on, don't anybody ever tell you you can't testify and witness because your past was bad. You've got every reason to testify and witness because God redeemed you from the power of your past. You are now a new creation. You are walking forward. Your past has no power over you anymore. You're walking as a kingdom kid and a child of the Most High. That's who you are because God set you free. Anyways, 2 Kings chapter 2, i got to have an anointing of God. The anointing of God is the impartation, the presence of the Holy Spirit operating in your life. The Spirit of God wants to operate in your life in a purpose. Everyone's been given a measure of faith. But God delights to put that anointing of his presence on your life and use you effectively in the kingdom. There's no one in the kingdom of God, in Christ's kingdom, that is designated useless. Every one of us are called to have a function under the anointing of God. When the Spirit of God comes in and pours His glory on us, everyone gets of the measure of God. And uniquely according to what God's designed for your life. How to fit hand and glove in the body of Christ. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to have the anointing of God. Well, there's a young man here who's well, getting a little bit older now. His, his name is Elisha. And Elisha's been following an old prophet called Elijah around for years, about 20 years, give or take. And Elijah has seen some great things. 
stood against all the prophets of Baal and all the prophets of Astros that he stood against the king and, and the king's wife Jezebel and he saw the fire of God come down on an offering and consume everything and, and he saw revival begin to sweep. He raised up an army of prophets, one of the first ones to ever do it. Prophets here and prophets there, prophet voices there, all under the authority of the one that understood the vision and the revelations of God. And he's getting ready to depart. And Elisha still walks, Sam walking alongside. So you got to make a decision. In the revelation that God gives me, I want to run my race and I don't want to quit. Say, don't quit. Don't quit. I'm not going to quit. I want to go all the way. But in order to go all the way, I got to have whatever I need. Whatever I need. Whatever I need. Don't say it's not for me. It's not for me. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. God is no respecter of persons. To each one, the calling and the election may be different, but God is no respecter of persons. What he's called to do, he wants to anoint you and he wants you to run your race as far as you can. He's got more than enough, but you get a hunger and thirst for what you need. Or you cannot accomplish your purpose. And Elisha finds out that Elijah's about to disappear. And he's not too keen on that idea. And there's a journey that they take real quickly. And Elijah says, I want you to stay here. I'm, I'm going to go to Bethel. Bethel is the house of God. It's more than just the house of God. It's a place where they saw the angels of God ascending and descending. Jacob saw the ladder. We call it Jacob's ladder. And he saw the angels of God ascending and descending. Jesus is like that Jacob's ladder. Because of his perfect sacrifice, heaven is now able to move consistently between heaven and earth. There's a flow of angelic realm moving on behalf of the believers. The house of God should be a place of serious God activity. He says, I'm going to Bethel. You stay here. And he says, oh, no, I'm not. Say, oh, no, I'm not. I'm going all the way. Say, going all the way. I said this this morning. Jesus, when he was getting ready to cross over to the other side of a other side of the lake, he made a command for his disciples to get into the boat, and, and everybody's and every clamoring into the boat, and there were a couple other little boats, because there were more disciples than there were the 12 all following with them. He had the 12, you had the others, I'm going wherever they're going, I don't care if they're the 12, I, went, I don't care, I'm number 13, I, I don't care about how bad that number is, I'll be number 15, call me number 50, it doesn't matter, because I want to be part of the 70. So get me a boat, I'm going with you ain't one of the 12, don't get offended. 70 others saw the anointing of God. There are others following right along. They ain't getting out of my sight. Come on, don't get, a, listen, don't get offended if you're not, if you're not called on the highest echelonces. Make sure because that person's got to live and act on that. Just say, look, I'm going along with. I'm going with. Get me a boat. I'm going with. I ain't staying here. I'm going to the other side. Lord, wherever you go, I'm going. Wherever he goes, we're going. That's why it says other little boats. All went. And when the storm came, they were all in the same storm. And when the storm calmed, they were all in the same calm. Think about it. That upper room had 120 people in it. And the majority of them had been with Jesus from the beginning. There's been a whole bunch of them had gotten into little boats. But there were those who said, Lord, I'll go with you, but, 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 I got this and this and this to do. Well, that X's you out of the equation. That X's you out of the equation. Yeah, but I got this to do. And Jesus, you know, I commanded, we're going to the other side. You want to stay here, you stay here, but you're X'd out of the equation because you're not going to be efficient nor effective. I can't use you. Because when you're in the mood, you're going to say, I'm ready, but I'm not going to be here. I'll be over there. I'll have crossed. That's why you want to say, if I want the anointing, I want to run with it. Yeah. All the way. So they went to Bethel. The prophets are saying, he's going to be taken up from you. Shut up, shut up. Then he says, now I need to go down to Jericho. You stay here. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going with you. The place of the first great battle of God. Well, the walls fell down flat. The place of battles. Somebody say battles. I get the angels of God. I get the presence of God. I'm in the house of God. Because, I've, because I had the revelation of God. Now I get to the place where the first battle was. Are you kidding me? God's bringing them back. It's like a history lesson. You need to know what God has done because if he did it for them, he'll do it for you. 
The walls came down. Mm. Go over there and look at that. They're down. They're down. How they're still down. The walls came down. That's a revelation of purpose and future. Hallelujah. The battle was won. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it because, because I'm going to face my own. So I want to see all the others because I want to see how God did it in theirs. Why? Because I'm going to want an anointing for mine. I want an anointing for mine. I got a revelation of God, but I got to go somewhere with the revelation of God. So I got to see what belongs to me. So when I was moving, now I was going to move on. He's, he's been to Jericho and he says, now I'm going back to the Jordan. Somebody say back to the Jordan. That's called a place of beginnings and a place of miracles. Wow. He says, stay here. He says, oh no. We're going across the Jordan. We'll go back to the place of beginning. Because your anointing and your equipping of God is a platform of beginnings for your life. If I want to be somewhere with God, I got to go all the way. I got to see the beginning. I want to see the fire and the power. And Elijah goes down there and he strikes the water and the water parts and through they go. Now where are they? They're back on the other side. There's the promised land. They're on this side. See, when it comes time for your beginning and your purpose, the anointing of God is for you, for you, to bring yourself and multitudes over to the other side. So that the anointing of God, he'll bring you to this side, so you can bring them to that side. Because that's your calling. You're going to bring somebody to the other side. There's an anointing of God to bring somebody to the other side. You're going to face the Jerichos. You're going to command the walls to come down. You're going to step in the presence of God and watch the angels of God move on your behalf. But you're not going to do it on somebody else's coattails. You're going to do it under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You're going to cross yourself. You're going to cross yourself. That's, that's what God wants you to do. See, that is personal between you and him. I get a revelation of God. That, that's, his, that's his revelation to me because I have value. You have value in Christ. He paid for you with his blood. So they go over to the other side, and there they are. And Elijah says, well, what do you want if, if I go? And he says, I need a double portion. Somebody say double portion. Double. You're not going to get double portion if you're not going to use it. Don't ask for something you're not ready to handle. So my attitude is instead of not asking for it, instead of not asking for it, Get yourself ready to handle it. Don't say it's not for me. I don't deserve a double portion. Get yourself ready for it. Say, I want to be ready for a double. I want to, I want, say, I want. Come on, this is, this is, this is, this is your choice, believer. You are no different than anybody else. God can bring you over to that place. I need that double portion. I want to get to that place. I want to get to that place of the, of the Mahanaim. I'm going to get to that place of Bethel. I want to see the angels of God minister. I want to see the house of God operate. I want to see, I want to know the walls are going to come down because I've seen it in my spirit. I've seen it. They're going to come. I want to know what's like to speak to those walls. In order to do that, I got to get back to the other side. I got to get to my beginning because I need a double portion. Why? Because I need to watch the Jordan part for me. I need God to open the door that no man can open. Because when God opens the door that no man can open, that means God opened it for you. He opened it for you. Oh, when God opens it for you, you don't sneak in because he opened it for somebody else and you snuck into the other side because then you have no idea. But if you go through because God opened it for you, that means God brought you in. He'll bring you all the way through. Come on, somebody give him a shout. That's why you need a miracle. It's personal. That's why it's personal. Because everyone's got to go through. He said, I want double portion. He said, well, if you see me when I go, you get it. And then comes the chariots of God. You know the story. The chariots of God, the horsemen of God, and sweep Elijah away in the whirlwind of God. The mantle of God falls from Elijah and falls toward Elijah. And somebody say, pick it up. Pick it up. Say, pick it up. That mantle's falling. Everybody should be fighting to get that thing. Mantle's elbows going. People pounding on people. My mantle. What Elisha does is he tears off the old things of himself because now that's done, grabs the mantle of God. Then Elijah wraps it around him, uses it, strikes the Jordan River, the whole thing parts, and Elisha begins to walk into the beginning of all the purposes and callings of his life. One more. You still with me? Why don't you go to Ezekiel chapter 47. I like this chapter. 
I like the Bible. I think it's pretty cool. How, how, how many like your Bible? Yeah. People don't read this thing. They think, oh, the Old Testament is just so, you know. Are you kidding me? It's everything. It's everything in type and shadow that is revealed to us in the New Testament. It's all the foundations. Jesus, Jesus would have preached, by the way, Jesus would have preached the Old Testament because that's all he had. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out. He had, a, he had to reveal every promise, every breakthrough, every provision. He had to show you all the covenants of God. The seven great redemptive names of Jesus Christ is what he became. And all the seven redemptive names of God that he would operate in. And all the blessings of provision is what he came to reveal. And what he was about to pay for with his own blood. This is the revelation. The New Testament gives us the revelation of what the Old Testament is. So we need to read the Old Testament so you get the God revelation the way God wants you to have it. Somebody say, do not repeat that. Because I can't. I know sometimes God just goes, what? <laughs> and he's God. Slow down. I can't. I'm short. If I was taller, I'd talk slower. But I'm, you know, it, it makes me talk faster because I understand, but it still seems to make me talk faster. Hi, young lady. Nice to have you at the service with us today. Hi. God bless you. God bless you. I know. I know it doesn't. I still use it as an excuse. My twin brother is six foot tall. Talks a lot slower. <laughs> Obviously, I finish all the sentences. Finish all his paragraphs. More like a day and a half ahead of him. Anyways, <laughs> Ezekiel chapter four. Yes, I do. And he is a full head of hair. Fun. He's a, and he's six foot tall. Oh, well. Oh, well. My wife's looking at me. Don't say that. Well, I just did. <laughs> full disclosure. Ezekiel 47. I want the double portion, but I got to get the revelation. Jesus came that I may have life and life with abundance. That's a fight to fight. So I got to make a decision wanting that double portion. One of the anointing is how deep am I willing to go? How deep in that anointing? How deep in the things of God? How much does God have and how far am I willing to go? Where is the miracles at in the presence of God? Where is the healing at in the breakthrough for the anointing in the presence of God? Where is it at? It's in the river. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow what? Rivers. There is a river whose streams make glad and rejoice the city of God. There is a river that needs to flow from deep within, a revelation of God that needs to flow over all that you are. There is a river of tremendous power. And church, sometimes we lose it. We don't have it. We don't realize what we've been missing. But the river of God is for the entire body of Christ because that is where the breakthrough, the miracles, and the healings are. I want you to look at this, look at this, look at this. Verse 1. It says, and he brought me back to the door of the temple. And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, which is where the pillars were in the temple. You want to know why the pillars were on the east side of the temple? Two beautiful pillars. Beautiful pillars. It's because when the sun rose in the morning and it would hit those pillars, the light of God would shine everywhere. They were a representation, a symbol of the support of God, the kingdom of God and his authority in those two explosive pillars. The glory of God on the inside would shine against all the gold and the sun would shine on the pillars that would be radiant and set off light running all through the hills because of the beauty of the pillars. But on that side, the side of the east, water was flowing from under the right side of the temple the south side of the altar, moving out toward the east. He brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate that faces east. And there was the water running right out on the outside. Somebody say a river. A river. You know, if you don't have the river of God, the whole Bible becomes nothing but legalisms. It becomes bondages. Sometimes we think in our religiosity, we're supposed to be quiet and subdued. Only cry in church, can't laugh. And we forget that God wants to fill you with the joy of heaven. Amen. He's a joyful God. Why aren't we? 
Why don't we have the fullness of God operating in our life? The world needs it. They don't need our religion. They need our relationship. They need the joy that flows out of you. The Spirit of God knows just how to witness. And he says, when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, verse 3, he measured a 1,000 meters. The depth of God is how far you want to go. 1,000 measuring out, 1,000 out. Thousand cubits out, and he brought me through the water. And how deep was the water? Through his ankles. This is nice. It's nice water. A little presence of God. Song service was good. I said, thousand cubits. But he didn't stop there. He said, He measured another thousand cubits and brought me into the water. And the water now was up to my knees. Hmm. How deep do I want to go in God? And now I'm moving through the water. That's a little scary, believers. Not everybody, th people may think you're squirrely. You get too much of God on you. Ah, uh, they already think you're squirrely. You might as well just have an anointed squirreliness all about your life. You might as well just, I mean, think of you pushing through the water. And now it's, and then it says, what? He goes out another thousand cubits. And how far is the water? He says, and the water was, he says, another thousand cubits. And it, and it came to my waist. I'm 3,000 cubits out into the things of God. And the water's up to my waist, but there's still nothing. It's good, but it's not enough. So it goes out another 1,000 cubits. And where's the water? It's over his head. It becomes a river in which he's swimming. A river in which he cannot pass. It's the inundating abundance of God's flow in his glory. And he shows that the depths of God are unfathomable. But from that place is when they turn and they look back toward the shores. And now on the shores is all these trees of life. Everything was living because of the tree. I could not cross have you seen all this? When you turn along the bank of the river, there are very many trees on this side and the other. He said, this water flows toward the eastern region, and it shall be that these trees are, are all about the waters of life and healing and the provision and the substance of God. Stand your feet in the house right now.